Today we'll be talking about an update uh, on the latest COVID-19 research uh, findings. Um, uh, in terms of, uh, next slide. Uh, we'll go through the usual. Um, um, this uh, webinar series uh, is organized by Ministry of Health and Wellness, University of Botswana, Botswana Harvard Partnership and Rutgers University. And you can join, join the mailing list by emailing robert at armumagradyahoo.com. Um, uh, the sessions are over Zoom, as you can see, and we would kindly ask that you mute your microphone. Um, uh, Moderator will actually uh, monitor uh, these um, these sessions, and uh, as well as uh, there'll be a question and answer session at at, at the end, of which uh, we'll give our people an opportunity to actually uh, ask questions and uh, answer uh, as accurate as we can. These sessions are recorded and made available after the se after these sessions, and they will be um, uh, posted online and I'll show where you can access them. We've actually had them since last year. And we do encourage feed, uh, feedback uh, via survey. Please tell us what topics you'd like to talk about, um, uh, where you are, especially in Botswana. We are worried about people in the district. Um, uh, so these are on Botswana, uh, on YouTube, Botswana Rutgers Partnership for Health. Um, uh, we've had these sessions since last year. Um, uh, we've spoken about different topics, including mechanical ventilation, oxygen use, We've had updates uh, on, on our guidelines uh, as of last year. And this year we've really concentrated on, on management, especially with oxygen as the, the pandemic uh, as trajectory has gone up. Uh, a lot of you to uh, visit this. Um, if you go to that website, um, I think probably the most important will be the document library, which has all the guidelines, actually, the clinical guidelines, guidelines on how to advise people to open up uh, um, um, an isolation facilities, guidelines for schools, public transport, retail stores. Uh, next slide. So today, I'm, I'm going to move uh, in a different direction. We're going to talk about the therapeutics for COVID-19. Um, uh, and uh, it will be, uh, the speaker will be myself. And then um, I'll hand over to, to uh, David Lawrence uh, to talk about uh, vaccines. And they, we've launched off the I'm Ready uh, the Mao campaign as of yesterday. And I'm sure a lot of people have uh, questions uh, about that. Uh, next slide. So in terms of myself, I think most of you know me, but um, I'm a medical specialist um, uh, I'm employed by University of Botswana, currently based at Sekitumi Lemassia in Princess Marina. I've been involved with COVID-19 since last year, January 1st, 2020. Uh, when we started screening uh, patients uh, with Professor Mosipil at the time, we know that our pandemic started in, in April. Um, I'm also a fellow in pulmonary sleep and critical care uh, medicine. I do run a service for long COVID um, uh, at Sekit Dumila Masire. So in terms of therapeutics, you know, there's been over 70,000 papers that have been uh, published uh, since the turn of the pandemic uh, last year around March. It's exactly actually about a year ago when uh, the COVID-19 was de declared a pandemic. So it's important that we know what works and what does not. And uh, it's important that we, we as clinicians and healthcare workers discuss uh, what we're still not sure about. But what we don't want is just because we have a crisis, um, uh, we start making excuses for lowering scientific. See what our guidelines are saying and what we have. Uh, next slide. 
So I, I just thought I'd go through the pathophysiology of uh, COVID-19 brief, briefly. We know that we've seen um, uh, the world over from the asymptomatic uh, stage all the way to uh, critical illness. And uh, if you look at the top here, it talks about the symptoms, the common symptoms that we know, the cough, uh, the taste, um, uh, change in taste or smell, um, uh, to all the way to uh, respiratory failure and multi-organ shock. And really this culminates with um, viral replication from low viral load from when you're asymptomatic to a point where you start to, to shed the virus to um, a cytokine storm or an inflammatory stage, um, uh, which really at that point, when you're between the viral replication and the, in, in, in the inflammatory stage, you're really requiring um, um, oxygen in the CPAP or, or um, the ICU unit. And really we've tried to uh, divide the therapies according to the stages. And this is really how we've, our most uh, centers around the world have uh, uh, manage their patient. So you can see for the asymptomatics really, uh, which is majority of patients around the world, it's, it's, it's really monitoring symptoms and uh, are not doing much. But when you get to a stage where you, you have severe illness or hospitalization really, you're looking at uh, starting antiviral therapy, uh, antibody therapy, you're looking at uh, intubation and oxygen uh, uh, therapy. And um, one of the most important thing is, you know, you want to keep your patients on uh, the mechanical ventilator for as short as possible. And uh, this is where things like uh, remdesivir and dexamethasone actually come into play. Next slide. So really one of the most important uh, treatments for, for COVID-19 has been uh, corticosteroids, commonly known as the holy water of medicine. Um, the recovery trial is really synonymous with uh, dexamethasone. We know that we've been using dexamethasone since last year in June, when um, um, the recovery trial uh, actually came out first to say that uh, steroids actually do make a difference. This is a trial that was done in the UK under the NHS uh, involving over 175 sites. A simple design with uh, patient collection done online uh, and entry as well as online randomization platform so they basically minimal interaction uh, between humans, which of course is important for COVID. And really, um, uh, we, they were looking at respiratory supported randomization, which involved invasive mechanical ventilation, oxygen only, or no oxygen received. Uh, they had primary and secondary outcome, primary outcome being mortality, and then secondary outcome, basically the length of time on the mechanical ventilator, and uh, you're discharged at 28 days. As you can see, the, the dexamethasone arm had 2,100 patients versus um, uh, the routine care 4.3. And um, really, if we look at um, uh, the odds ratio, we can see that there's quite uh, a big difference between uh, the dexamethasone and the usual care for all participants, mechanical ventilation and uh, oxygen only. And all these actually show a benefit Uh, Twelve percent here, and then um, and then um, um, a risk reduction of about twenty seven percent on the mechanical uh, ventilation. Now, for for oxygen, you can see that the, the rate ratio actually crosses one, which means actually that um, there's potential harm, um, uh, which is why we we said there's actually no improvement, and uh, that there's potential harm for those patients that are stable and not receiving oxygen. And therefore we have recommended actually in our guidelines as uh, most centers that if a patient is not requiring oxygen, they mustn't actually be given steroids. I know people are tempted to say that uh, they, if you're not on oxygen, you really must be getting steroids, but there's no benefit and there's a risk of uh, potential harm. Uh, next slide. So in terms of uh, the management, uh, so for mild and COVID steroids, uh, like I've said, but for moderate and severe uh, COVID-19, if they require oxygen 
and um, the oxygen saturation is uh, below 90, 94%. We give steroids for a maximum of 10 days. We do stop them earlier if the six symptoms resolve. Our ideal uh, steroid is dexamethasone as per, as per the recovery trial. We do have an IV and PO formulation. And I've actually found out that uh, district hospitals actually, uh, some have a PO formulation. Um, uh, there's been several other studies actually that have shown that all steroids actually have a benefit. And uh, these are the equivalent doses that may be given um, uh, in, if dexamethasone is not available. 80 and then methylprednisone at uh, 32 milligrams. And um, um, these, um, if, even before transfer to second this it's very important that, that these are started uh, immediately and maintained for all patients um, uh, required, requiring oxygen. These are available on the guidelines, on the Botswana COVID-19 guidelines. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Um, moving on to anti antiviral agents. Um, we know about remdesivir. Uh, there was a lot of, lot of noise about it last year. In terms of uh, um, what remdesivir is, it's actually a repurp repurposed antiviral drug. It, it was actually developed in 2015 by the US Military Research Institute. And initially it was to be used for Ebola, but unfortunately the results were not um, uh, exciting. It, it, it incorporates a nucleoside uh, analog and inhibits an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase of all coronaviruses, including SARS-CoV-2. Well, actually, I um, um, used the remdesivir. Uh, hello, am I back? Are you okay? Hello. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. You can continue. Oh, okay. We lost you for a while. Okay, apologies for that. We've clearly had a, a technical glitch. Um, uh, yes. Um, uh, getting back, um, uh, we were talking about rem remdesivir and the ACCT trial. ACTT trial. And um, this trial was basically an adaptive, randomized, double-blind, placebo and efficacy of remdesivir in hospitalized patients. And um, we were looking at, uh, they were looking at medium recovery, 10 versus 15 days. And really it was to see whether there was a mortality benefit or, or, or time to recovery uh, benefit. And uh, really there was, a, in terms of comparison, the mortality was 11.4 versus 15.2 percent in the usual case, with a hazard ratio of about 0.73, which which is a, about a 17 percent uh, reduction. But actually, when they went on to complete the trial, looking at the five and the ten days, the, the outcomes were actually similar in in in, in both arms. And um, um, really a conclusion could not uh, be reached in terms of mortality benefit, but what they did conclude on is that um, uh, it may somewhat actually uh, hasten uh, or improve time to recovery, uh, which is why we, we actually have it in our guidelines and we use it um, in circuit to Mila Masira hospital. But in terms of mortality um, uh, and um, um, 
um, uh, the prevention of mechanical ventilation, there's actually no, no, no benefit. Um, next slide. And then we know about the solidarity trial, which was uh, spearheaded by WHO when it, it involved a whole host of um, uh, therapies. And um, um, it looked at uh, basically, um, uh, I think um, more than 15 therapies. And we've picked uh, the ones that we thought were really interesting, remdesivir, doxycloroquine, aluvia, olopinavir, uh, ritonavir, as well as inter interferon. And, we know starting off with um, um, remdesivir that I've just mentioned that they, there's really uh, little to no impact. We can only say that it might uh, actually shorten the time that um, a severe COVID patient recovers. In terms of hydroxychloroquine, there's clearly no, no benefit if you look at that graph. It's the same with um, uh, um, aluvia or lopinavir, with the ritonavir. And it's the same with interferon, which is why all these drugs actually have not been incorporated uh, by most uh, centers or institutions uh, around the world. Uh, next slide. Um, um, there were more studies actually that were, were done on hydroxychloroquine, both on as pre-exposure, uh, hospitalized outpatients as post-exposure. Uh, this drug was studied quite extensively and we've quoted a number of studies if people want to go through. But all these studies were looked at by scientists uh, across the world, including members of our task force. They have shown no benefit. In fact, there have been reports of death um, uh, in some uh, clinicians is, is coming out of India. We, we do know that there's a certain uh, ex-president actually was uh, encouraging for the use of uh, hydroxychloroquine sometime last year. However, I think it's quite clear from uh, most of these studies that there's actually no uh, um, benefit in terms of uh, recovery or even prevention of mortality. Uh, next slide. Um, Cortisine has been a new kid around the block in terms of a repurpose therapy. We know that it's used for gouty arthritis and it really, uh, it helps with um, uh, chronic inflammatory states. So there was an excitement uh, around the co-corona trial about uh, a month uh, to six weeks back. And in fact, um, uh, I was one of the clinicians that was very excited about that. But unfortunately the abstract and the data did not live up to the hype. And uh, the study was stopped on the 5th of March after re recruiting uh, over 11,000 patients. And um, the comparison really was 20% mortality with colchicine versus 19% with usual care. So that was completely dropped disappointing, but the reality is that it really doesn't work. So we, we shouldn't be using it in, in, in our patients. Uh, next slide. Um, uh, the new kid or the, the, the drug that's probably being talked about at the moment is ivermectin. There's a lot of noise about it in South Africa. There's a lot of noise about it here. Um, um, you'd need you know 100 times the dose to achieve um, uh, um, in vitro antiviral efficacy and um, from the randomized controlled trials that have been conducted there's really no convincing data so we still stand by the fact that you know people really shouldn't be self-medicating neither should clinicians be using ivermectin or advising people to take this either as uh, pre or post uh, exposure prophylaxis uh, next slide Next slide. Um, convalescent plasma has been used, uh, I think since uh, last year in, in, in June. It's been trialed initially as, a, as observational studies in the US and in the UK. Multiple large studies um, have, have been ongoing and have been, have been published, including uh, an arm in the recovery and this also has not been shown to be any effective as, as treatment. And of course, we, 
we we don't have um, um, uh, the resources um, um, to, to to actually be using convalescent uh, plasma uh, at the moment. Uh, next slide. Um, we then have a uh, tocilizumab, an IL-6 uh, receptor blocker. Three trials that have looked at um, uh, tocilizumab, uh, which um, we know that IL-6 uh, is a cytokine that really um, uh, get to the inflammatory stage of a cytokine storm where patients are mechanically ventilated. We know that they have high levels of interleukin-6. And this has been associated with increased mortality. So these trials were actually looking at that. Um, the Convactor trial uh, had showed no impact, while the Rama uh, Cap trial showed improved outcome, including survival in hospitalized patients. And this was followed on by the tocilizumab uh, uh, arm in the recovery trial, which actually showed benefit with a 14% uh, uh, reduction. It's been used in conditions like uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, calculated uh, about six weeks ago, how much each, each patient for, for 10 to 15 day uh, uh, dose would cost. And it's, it's about 100 to 150,000 Pula per patient. And uh, I don't think realistically um, uh, that would be uh, ideal um, uh, in our setting. Um, next slide. Uh, neutralizing monoclonal antibodies um, where FDA approved last year a, a, in November. We've got two cocktails, um, um, uh, one involving banlanivimab and then one involving casarivimab and indamivimab. And um, both these have been shown to decrease uh, viral load and uh, frequency in our patients, as well as um, uh, a reduction for requirement for medical visits. And as usual, these are very costly. Cost about, I think, seven to 800,000 uh, per patient. So we cannot afford these, uh, although they work. So I think uh, when we look at our budget and what uh, the other drugs uh, that uh, I've spoken about, um, and, and unfortunately, these cannot be uh, recommended. Uh, next slide. So where does that leave us here uh, in Botswana? I've spoken quite about a number of drugs. Um, um, hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine, azithromycin, ivermectin for COVID-19 does not work. It's same with colchicine, lopinavir, interferon, convalescent plasma. Remdesivir, really, we've put it there as, as something that is, uh, um, um, I'd say uh, it, it's useless, but we, we use it uh, because we, we know that it can shorten, um, uh, possibly shorten uh, our recovery. But those drugs to the left really, for specifically for COVID-19, they really um, do not offer much benefit. So we really shouldn't be using them. If that we are using them for something else or other comorbidities, uh, yes. Um, the useful drugs really remain steroids. Um, steroids are affordable. Um, 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 they available all, all over Botswana um, um, and um, the different kinds actually work. We know that dexamethasone is actually the, the steroid of choice, but anything else that um, any of the hospital or the clinicians have uh, must be given and it works. Neutralizing bodies and interleukin-6 inhibitors are very expensive. They do offer benefit, but they do not offer the benefit that steroids uh, offer. So I, I still think, you know, steroids, um, 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 as well as um, other um, uh, treatment th therapies on our guidelines, including venous thromboembolism, um, prophylaxis, and oxygen therapy remain really what um, we should be using. Next slide. So in summary, um, steroids, steroids, steroids. For patients that are on oxygen, uh, um, um, and um, uh, um, uh, severely sick, whether they are mechanically ventilated, uh, nasal flow, um, um, they're using CPAP or high flow. Uh, it's important that we give steroids and we give steroids um, uh, early. 
all steroids uh, show benefit. Uh, next slide. Um, at this point, I'll hand over to my colleague uh, and friend, um, uh, David Lawrence. Um, um, David has been involved uh, in COVID-19 in Botswana since um, last year, um, like myself. Um, um, he's, he's a medical doctor who specializes in HIV and sexual health and works for the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and has been working at um, uh, Botswana Harvard AIDS Institute partnership for the last four years, um, mainly doing research work. His day job is mainly centered around clinical research uh, and focus on advanced HIV AIDS. And uh, he runs actually our, uh, our IDCC um, uh, failure clinic on Wednesdays. For the last year, mainly it's been COVID, 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 uh, particularly in terms of uh, guideline writing, co-facilitating webinar series like this one. And he's actually just moved back to the UK and uh, he will be giving this talk quarantining in a hotel at London Heathrow Airport. Over to you, David. Great, thanks very much, Tommy. And, and, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me to come and speak today. Um, it's my first few days away from Botswana for several years, and I can tell you that the weather in London is, is quite bad, and I'm already missing the, the sun and all of my friends and colleagues in Botswana, so at least we can be connected virtually here. Um, thanks for the intro, Tommy. I'm going to give a bit of an update on the latest evidence around the vaccines for COVID-19, which is a very big topic and obviously something that could be the subject of an entire webinar series in itself um, and it's a very dynamic subject as well some of these papers that i'm referencing were published in the last day or two or you know it's a combination sometimes just of press releases because the data haven't even been publicly shared there's, there's a lot going on a lot of interest but of course it's very relevant to our situation in botswana now that we have the some doses of the astrazeneca vaccine um, uh, and are just kind of starting with this community awareness campaign that I'm ready. So I hope that I'll be able to summarize for you um, basically the latest evidence about the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, um, particularly about the dosing schedule, uh, the effectiveness against the South African variant, uh, and then some of these risks about side effects. And I've seen that some of you have kindly submitted some questions in advance of this presentation and I can see the, the kind of the concerns that are shared amongst the group and the, the, the frequently asked questions that are coming in. So I hope that I'll be able to have answered most of those questions by the end of this session, but if not, we can discuss further. Um, uh, so the, uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the, the Oxford AstraZeneca, it's the Tradox-1 vaccine. I just want to explain a little bit about how it works. It's a uh, it's a viral vector vaccine, which essentially means that it's derived from um, a chimpanzee adenovirus, uh, which is used as a vector. So there's essentially a weakened adenovirus that is more commonly responsible for causing a bit of a cold in a chimpanzee. Um, and that, that, that adenovirus now, now contains the genetic sequence of the spike protein. And you'll have seen a lot about the spike protein over the last year, and it's always uh, included on those pictures of the of, of the virus itself and essentially that genetic sequence is contained within the adenovirus and then when that virus is is entered into the body um, the the immune system uses that genetic code um, to produce a surface spike protein that then essentially generates an immune response and means that when exposed to that spike spike protein in the future from you know a real life coronavirus infection it should be able to evade that and fight it off. And that's the general mechanism of the, the Oxford vaccine. So these are the, the kind of the, the, the interim findings that were initially published. So when, when everyone got very excited about the, this vaccine, it, it was reported, it was one of the first ones to report um, with an overall efficacy of 70% um, reported in the first trials. And, and they, 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 they included participants in the UK predominantly, but also Brazil and South Africa. And these were the kind of uh, findings that were published initially. But actually, when that was published towards the end of last year, that excluded the South African um, 
participants. And the reason for that was that that RCT within this larger study actually hadn't by that point accrued enough events. So for you to actually get into this initial analysis as it were, it was required that there had been five infections within, within, within that RCT, which they hadn't. So when this initial data were presented for this vaccine, that the South African um, study wasn't actually included and that's only really the South African data we'll come to later that was actually only published two days ago in the New England Journal but ultimately here you can see that there was a very marked difference in the number of people that had received the vaccine um, who went on to um, develop or, or become symptomatic of, of coronavirus versus those that had not and this was where a lot of that initial excitement was and the most important thing that came from that was the fact that throughout this study, nobody was actually hospitalized due to COVID-19. So these cases that are kind of demonstrated here with the orange line, these are cases of coronavirus that weren't severe, that didn't require hospitalization. And basically none of these patients went on to die from COVID. And I think that's a really important thing to think about when we're discussing vaccines is obviously we're interested in preventing onward transmission and also preventing someone becoming symptomatic or and well with COVID, but one of the main things we very much want to avoid is hospitalisation and death. One thing as well that, that was kind of came out relatively surreptitiously with, with the vaccine data was some, some things to do with the dose of the Oxford vaccine. There were two groups um, that were vaccinated. Initially, uh, the first group actually received a slightly underdose of their first dose, um, and this group turned out to have a stronger response to the vaccine. And another thing that was quite interesting was about the timing of the second dose. Um, so we'd seen actually in the UK that they'd adopted an approach rather than to just wait a month to give the second dose or three weeks that they wanted to wait for up to three months with the argument being that if we, if we delay giving the second dose, then we can give more people the first dose. I'm working on this idea that, you know, you really want to kickstart the immune system to develop this antibody response. Um, and this is a study then, this has included the South African data that was published more recently, which is a pooled analysis of all the different strategies and the impact of the timing on the booster. And essentially, you'll see here on the, uh, on the y-axis, this is increasing vaccine efficacy, uh, and this is the actual antibody response. And as the boost time, the interval between the two doses has increased, the number of anti the antibody response and therefore also you know related to that the, the efficacy of the vaccine has increased to the point where it seems that actually delaying for for for, for three months for 12 weeks is, is is very effective because that first dose is still really doing its job uh, and so they found in this pooled analysis that there was a 76 percent efficacy after the first dose among all individuals but if, if if you'd had an interval of 12 weeks that first vaccine the efficacy actually increased to 82%. And I think this also is something else to think about that uh, initially when a lot of these studies have been reported, you'll have the, the number in your mind of how efficacious it is, you know, what percent it is, 70%, 90%. But I think what we've seen consistently with most of the vaccines that have been given is that in the real world, the efficacy has been much higher than was reported. So for instance, with the, this AstraZeneca vaccine, that was initially reported as being 70% efficacious, but you'll see that these numbers in the fullness of time have actually increased. But of course, one of the things that we're very much interested in is the variants and particularly the variants in the spike protein, given that, as I described earlier, the antibody response, the, the, the whole mechanism of the, these vaccines is really based on either the on the genetic code of the spike protein. So if the protein itself changes, then does that mean that it's possible for the for the virus to then evade um, evade the, the vaccine response. Uh, and we've these are probably the two most well known. The B1.1.7 is the, the UK variant in, in terms of the fact that it was first identified in Kent in the UK and found to be about 50% more transmissible um, amongst individuals, but not necessarily more severe. And then we have the what's called the, the, the South African variant because it was first identified there the B.1.351. Uh, and we're still kind of gathering evidence and data on this, but it seems that it's obviously is similarly with the UK variant linked to increased transmissibility. 
uh, and perhaps a higher viral load, and those two things may be related about the higher viral load causing an increased transmissibility, but no, no difference in the, in, the, in the outcomes. And I think it's fair to say now from, from the, the, the genotyping data that we're getting from South Africa that the majority of cases now are caused by this variant. So it's become the dominant variant uh, in South Africa and, and most likely in Botswana as well as, as, well as our neighbours. So obviously there's the initial concern about the increased transmissibility and the fact that that will be fueling the, the epidemic in, in Botswana, but then also there's real concerns about the fact that um, uh, if, if, the, 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 if, if our immune system can, even either in individuals who've contracted COVID before or those who've been vaccinated, whether or not actually this variant can evade that immune response so there's a couple of, of papers that were, that were published about a month or so ago looking at uh, the plasma of individuals from who had previously been infected with what we'll call the original variant of, of COVID, the Wuhan um, uh, genotype. And seeing that actually, if you look down here, this is, this is the South African variant, but ultimately the, the neutralization, the antibody response was, was far diminished. And this was using convalescent plasma from donors and also using live virus. Uh, and this is really what triggered a lot of the concerns about the fact that um, A, people that have had coronavirus previously may not be immune to, to this variant, but also that the vaccines may not work. And this is really what triggered a lot of concern. And then this is, this is the data really that's very worth looking at. And this was published just two days ago in the New England Journal, looking specifically at the efficacy of the AstraZeneca vaccine in the South African variant, because these are the data that we were waiting for from that initial study. Remember I said that the, the South African data didn't make it into the initial paper because not enough infections had occurred by that point. And this is just the, the results of that South African data. This was the, the COV-005 RCT. So these are 2,026 HIV negative individuals who were recruited in South Africa similar numbers recruited to a placebo versus a vaccine. And ultimately, the, in terms of how efficacious the vaccine was, well, amongst those individuals, there were 90, 23 plus 19, so there were 42 people that went on to develop COVID. All of them had mild to moderate disease. And you'll see actually that the, the numbers were relatively similar. So 3.2% in the placebo arm and 2.5% in the vaccine arm which gives an overall efficacy of 21.9%. And you'll see here very, very wide confidence intervals because of the, the relatively small sample size, the low number of events that occurred. So not very much certainty really here in these numbers. And of those 42 cases, they were able to uh, genotype them uh, and identify that the majority of them were the, were the South African variant, the B1351 uh, variant. So that raises a concern there just in terms of the general uh, low efficacy um, of that vaccine in that population. And I think we can be quite confident that that was in the context of the South African variant. But what we do need to point out really is that there were no cases of severe disease or hospitalization in this group. And I think one of the reasons for that was that the median age in this, in this study was just 30 years old with an interquartile range of 24 to 40. So this was a very young population of individuals. It was a small sample size. And as I said, nobody was hospitalized or died. So it's very difficult to draw too many meaningful conclusions from this study because there's actually quite a lot of caveats there. And the things that we're trying to avoid particularly, obviously we want to avoid as many things as possible, but we particularly want to avoid hospitalization and death. Well, those things didn't occur, but they also didn't occur in the placebo arm because of the fact that we had a relatively young population who were already at baseline, less likely to be hospitalized or die from COVID. But I think that there's definitely quite a strong awareness that there's gonna be a need to develop boosters to account for these variants. And I'm aware that that is what's going on with the Oxford AstraZeneca. So one of the other things that's come up and there were definitely a good, old, a good few questions of these that came in um, on the, the pre-submission questions was about uh, the risk of blood clots with this vaccine. So we, you will have seen following in the news, it's a different day, is a different country making a different decision about what to do about this vaccine. But 
Uh, there are a number of European countries, including France, Germany, Italy, that said they were going to stop giving the vaccine because there had been an increased number of blood clots. But actually, the WHO and the European uh, Medicine Regulatory Authority both said have looked at that evidence and said, well, you can do that as you like as a country, but we as, as Europe and we as the WHO don't advise against that because, of course, the benefits of implementing a widespread vaccine program far outweigh those risks. So I've, I've tried to get a bit of an idea of exactly what these numbers are. Um, it's a little bit difficult to dig down and find exactly, but I found as of the 10th of March, there'd been 30 cases of a blood clot. So this is a DBT or a PE um, in most cases, reported among 5 million people that have been given the vaccine in Europe. Uh, and in, in, in the UK, because obviously they're doing a pretty good job with the vaccination programme, that's they've actually given more than 10 million doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine here. And actually, on review of how often these incidents are just in the general population, these are no more than are routinely expected. And definitely as well, far less than other drugs that uh, seem to be you know, far more acceptable, as it were. The combined oral contraceptive pill, as we know, comes with a risk of a DVT. Uh, and obviously that's part of the pre-prescription counselling, but um, this isn't really a significant difference. And, and I think obviously we can look as well at the, at the, the vaccine study itself, the, the, um, the, the data I was talking about earlier, and they had four clots in the vaccine group and eight in the placebo group, small numbers of events, also small numbers of individuals. And you think about the number that have received vaccines compared to the number that were in the trial. But still, there was no signal at that point either. So I, I suspect that what will happen here, but don't quote me on it, is that this will all turn into nothing. Uh, and a lot of those countries will just end up continuing to give the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, uh, and that they've stopped it in really a kind of an overabundance of caution. So that, that's kind of a summary of the, the Oxford AstraZeneca. But then I think it's worth just talking about the other vaccines as well. I mean, I focus on AstraZeneca because that's the one that we've got in the country. It seems to be the one that we've got most immediate access to. Um, I don't sit on the task force, the vaccine task force, the presidential task force. I don't know what's been ordered and what's coming, but we all know that the AstraZeneca is in the country. We've seen it arriving on the cargo ship. Um, but I think it's worth just discussing the other vaccines. And you'll probably be familiar with most of these. I've tried to summarise here what the efficacy was as stated in the uh, in the, the kind of the primary papers that have been presented from those studies. And obviously all of these numbers are good. Um, I don't think it's necessarily overly useful to compare 90% with 70% when really we're looking to have a widespread vaccination program. And, and as I said, a lot of these are turning out to be better in real life than actually we're expected. But I will just talk a bit about some of the ones that are maybe on the continent or coming a bit closer. So. The, uh, particularly with a focus on the impact of the South African variant. So some of these are unpublished data, they're just from press releases, um, because it's, it's all so new as it were. But the Novavax, um, which is the MVX-CoV-2373, now that's been trialled in, in, in multiple countries, but they have published their data or they've presented their data at least on their participants that were recruited in South Africa. Um, and they've shown that you know that the the vaccine does work; it's efficacious. But actually, they had had initially demonstrated a, an efficacy of ninety five point six percent against that original strain. And now, when they've broken it down by the variants, the UK strain is diminished, and the South African strain diminished quite a bit more to sixty percent efficacy. And as I say, this was actually proven to be the South African variant. So again, we're seeing here another vaccine that was less efficacious against the South African variant. And you'll see that there's a, there's a pattern that emerges, the same with the, the Janssen or the Johnson & Johnson single dose vaccine, and that's the thing that's quite nice and novel about that vaccine, is actually it is less effective uh, in, in the South African variant, but actually very good at preventing severe and critical infection, which as I said, is, what, is one of our priorities. And then Moderna, again, that's an RNA vaccine. That had reported efficacy of 94.5% in trials. And I'm sorry, this picture's not very clear because it's just a tiny little screenshot from a paper. But they did an internal investigation to look at the number of antibodies that are produced. Um, I think this was in monkeys as well, when they 
uh, in fact, then with the South African variant, and actually there's a six-fold reduction in the number of antibodies that are, that are produced in response to this variant. But they think that this would be enough to still provide a protective response. But even, you know, there, there's a long, and, and Moderna aren't the only ones here, but they're working on developing a booster. They've actually developed this booster, which is called like the, the DOP351 booster, that's already going into a phase one trial to check for safety. But I think probably what's going to happen in the long run is regardless of what vaccine we start going with, by the time we're ready to start revaccinating and giving boosters, as, as is anticipated, I think people will get boosters probably every year of a COVID vaccine, but then they'll be getting a booster against different variants as they emerge. So I think that kind of summarizes everything and the latest data. As I said, it's a very dynamic field and it's difficult to keep track of it because a new paper gets released every few minutes that's giving you the latest updates, but hopefully that will summarize things as, as far as you understand them for now. Um, and I guess the next thing really is just to point out the fact that it's time for us all to get our arms ready, because I know we're all very eager and waiting to receive some vaccines. Um, that's everything from me. Um, I'll hand back over to, to you now and we can, we can take some questions. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, David, um, for that great talk on vaccines. Um, I think at this point, um, we will go through um, the questions that were, that were sent to us uh, by email um, uh, to go through them and try to answer them as best as possible. But I'll start um, uh, in, um, in the chat box. The first question was, if the data is, is not conclusive on remdesivir, why are we still using it? Costs about 40,000 pila for 10 days of treatment. I think as I mentioned in the, in the presentation, um, the data is inconclusive uh, on um, mortality benefit. But um, the data did show that there is uh, remdesivir does uh, reduce the time uh, um, spent in hospital, so it did time to recovery. So I think that's the, that's that's the reason why it's used in in Seged Tumile. There's also another question probably related to that and the cost of an ICU bed um, um, or high dependency to balance against the forty thousand pula which may shorten the length of stay in critical care. I'm not sure how much an ICU bed uh, costs in, in Seget to me. I, I know it in the private sector, if I'm not mistaken, costs about 30 to 40,000 pula a day, which may be more. But I think one of the biggest impediments probably um, in and around Kaburon has been stuffing our ICU. Um, we now currently have a CPAP unit next to an ICU in Seget to Mille. Um, but the only other hospital that has an ICU ward for COVID is Bokamus, so GPH doesn't. Sibila is currently uh, manning about a 10, 10, 11 bed for COVID. I don't, I don't know how many high care beds will be there. So the biggest problem with getting ICU uh, to increase is actually staffing, um, even trying to get uh, anesthetists or intensivists to, to come and look. I mean, Sagitumi has been uh, quite an issue. Um, and then um, I, I see Ava Avalos questions. Uh, that the question has been answered. And then moving on to the questions we received, what is um, the current thinking around duration of vaccine immunity? Do we think uh, we're looking at an endemic? I think David already answered this about um, vaccine boosters. We're likely to be getting boosters every year. In some areas or some population, the, 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 the virus is slightly to, to, to be endemic. The AstraZeneca vaccine, what are we saying to use or not to use safety profile? I think D David went through, uh, uh, through that. Um, uh, in terms of to use or not, I think that's a question that has to be answered by the task force and Ministry of Health. They did launch the I'm ready campaign yesterday. I think uh, we would have to wait to see which vaccines will be used on top of the AstraZeneca and when the rollout will be. I do understand there's an online platform where people have already started to register actually uh, for the vaccine so that uh, these... Um, is AstraZeneca vaccine still going to be administered here in Botswana when other countries are... I think we've spoken about the WHO statement uh, um, in the presentation. David answered that question. 
Um, the next one is, is there time when the vaccine will be given to the whole population? Um, again, we have to wait for the Ministry of Health to give us that timeline in terms of uh, vaccinating high risk group uh, and then eventually rolling it out to the whole population. Negative PCR test is currently used as a criteria to release individuals from isolation. Is it really the gold standard? As far as I know, this is uh, not. We've, we've never used a negative PCR to release individuals from isolation. I think we know that at around seven to 10 days, um, uh, the, the virus that is shared by individuals that are asymptomatic or mild symptoms is really dead. It's, it's, it's different for patients that are severely ill, but we've never required a second test to release you from isolation. Um, vaccine safety on immunocompromised uh, people, that one I'm not sure about. Maybe David, if you could comment on that. Um, David, are you there? Yeah, sure. Yes, I'm here. That's, um, that's a good question. So the, the study that I presented of the, the, the 4,000 individuals in South Africa, the, the COG005 RCT for the Oxford AstraZeneca, they did recruit a few hundred people with HIV, um, but there wasn't anything really significant in those findings. It was a very small number. Um, I think what I, what I often refer to is um, the British HIV Association guidelines for COVID vaccination, particularly in, given the fact that the vaccination program is doing quite well this side, they've advised that the vaccine should be made available to everyone, irrespective of CD4 count or viral suppression. Um, and I think that's, that's a good move and one that we should also follow in Botswana. There's not been any significant signal or reasons to be concerned about the safety on immunosuppressed individuals. All right, thanks, David. Uh, the next question is, what are the research findings of the pathophysiology of the new South African virus? I think that's been discussed extensively in research papers and um, previously on this webinar. It's um, mutations, and, um, and um, I think that when the virus actually originally started in South Africa, it was then transmitted to the UK and several other countries. Uh, the last question here is, what is your position regarding the latest findings, possible side effects, or AstraZeneca? We've already covered that. Um, um, then on the chat box, um, will there be consultations and campaigns to address the huge um, um, amounts of vaccine hesitancy we are seeing? Nearly every person I see in clinic is talking about it, spend a lot of time answering questions and encouraging people to take this. It's a very good uh, question and concern. I think I would hope that the, the I'm ready Lamal campaign would address that. Unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to hear the speakers and, and exactly what they spoke about. But, but from what I understand, there will be advertisements and campaigns uh, to, to address this and to also to educate uh, the public. Um, I think everybody's aware that you know there's a lot of hesitancy and concern about uh, the AstraZeneca and it's our duty I think as clinicians to make our patients as well as family members friends understand really what um, um, this um, vaccine um, negativity is about and, uh, and we explain really that we need scientific evidence before we make any uh, concrete conclusions. Do we know if the vaccine will be made mandatory or not? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, that I, I don't know. I do know that several countries have done that. Um, several countries have said you will not enter bars, restaurants without a vaccine. Without vaccine passports. So I think it's inevitable that at some point, um, uh, if people don't get vaccinated, they may choose to say no, but they may not get the opportunity to travel to other countries. Whether they will make it uh, mandatory within um, um, Botswana itself, um, uh, that I don't have an answer to. Uh, how soon after having COVID infection can one uh, have a, a vaccine? Um, good question. I know several reports and papers have was, were published last year about um, getting an infection, developing antibodies, and then eventually only needing one booster shot instead of two. It would be interesting to see what the latest evidence uh, uh, says to be honest, I have not. I, I am not updated on that. I don't. Don't know, David. Um, 
Yeah, I think that there's quite limited data on, on that, but in terms of the recommendations, I know that uh, the CDC initially at one point said, oh, you must wait for three months if you've had COVID before you have a vaccine. And now they've changed and said, oh no, it's fine. Just once you're feeling better. And then similarly in, in the UK, they've just been saying, oh, um, if you've had COVID, wait until you're feeling better and, and at least a month. Um, so, I, and then those are things that I guess we'll be interested to hear what the task force do say about that. Um, and then I just wanted to chip in, if I may, on, on that discussion about the vaccine hesitancy. I can see that someone said that the Ministry have done a survey and found quite high acceptance. And I'm wondering what everyone's experience has been. I, I, I seem to recall having conversations six or so months ago and struggling to find many people that would take a vaccine when I was discussing it in, in clinic at Princess Marina. But that I think that things have changed slightly in the last couple of months, specifically, possibly because it's been so bad and so many people um, have lost loved ones and friends and relatives to COVID now over the last couple of months that I can sense a bit of a change in the way that people are thinking about the vaccine because they're seeing COVID as such an immediate threat, something that's really affected their lives more now than it had. But I'm wondering what other individuals think about that because that could potentially be obviously a very large challenge to our implementation of the vaccine. Yes, um, I, I, I do agree. David, you did break off a little bit. In fact, I lost my, my internet. I don't know if everybody did hear the response um, to that or whether, I think it'd be best if you, you, you repeat. Yes, yeah, so I was just saying for the, from the time that you've had COVID to having a vaccine, there's no real kind of concrete data, but it seems to be that you shouldn't have the vaccine when you're sick with COVID, but once you've started to feel better. So the CDC states say that you can take it uh, as soon as you're feeling better, you, that you're recovered. And in the UK, they say it must be at least a month since you tested or developed your symptoms. Um, I'm not sure how far the, the, the plans are in terms of the specifics with the, with the Botswana and um, response, um, but it does seem like it's relatively safe to take it as long as you're feeling better. Thanks, David. Um, I think at this point people can un unmute um, uh, themselves and ask questions. Um, I think I do agree on the chat box. Um, the halting of the AstraZeneca obviously in Europe is not helping with the hesitancy, but we do have to push on. We have to encourage people so that we try to get life back to normal as much as possible. Uh, everybody's talking about AstraZeneca and, and, and clots. They cannot stop talking about it. And it's, it's very important that we try to explain scientifically as much as possible to, to say why we should uh, soldier on and um, actually uh, vaccinate our population. Because yes, we're losing a lot of uh, uh, people. And at the, at the rate that the trajectory of the pandemic is going, uh, we'll reach about 600 deaths before they, they, the month ends. Uh, anybody, any more questions? It's, it's five o'clock. Uh, hi, Tommy. Yes. Sorry, I've raised my no. hand. Yes. Oh, yes. 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 That's all right. Um, hi, Dr. Lawrence. Thank you so much for the presentations. I believe for my part, you've really answered a lot of the questions that I've been having. And um, it's true that a lot of people have sort of moved away from wanting the vaccine to now thinking, is it really safe? And I think that as a community of health professionals, it's up to us now to try and educate people in the right way to try and um, dismiss the not so true um, trending news that have been going around on WhatsApp and Facebook and social media. And honestly, I think most of us are tired and a vaccine would really help to open up a lot of things, you know, open up travel and it's really on us now to try and help. The government can only do so much and we are, really most of the time people listen to us because we are doctors and I think it's up to us 
to stand together and have one voice, say one thing so that people don't get confused. And again, thank you so, so much for your presentations. Both of you were absolutely on point and um, you answered most of the questions that I've been having. So thank you. And thank you, Maka, for, for, for those comments. I do agree. We really need to um, uh, be together. We need to be talking the same language and we need to get the, the, the population vaccinated as soon as possible. I think Prof. Musipili did mention about the Israeli uh, vaccination plan. Uh, if people have time, please go look at what they did. They're obviously more technologically advanced, but I think that is what Ministry of Health and the task force are trying to sort of look at, whether we will achieve the speed of vaccinating the population as they did, that remains to be answered. But I think that the point is, you know, we need to vaccinate um, uh, people and we need to do it quickly. Great, and I've uh, just seen, I've just seen, sorry, a couple of extra questions. Um, one from, okay. from Dr. Avalos. Do we know the latest prevalence of the South African variant in Botswana? Um, I think we've got a rough idea. Uh, we haven't genotyped a huge amount. Uh, and I'm not completely up to date, but I would, from what I've heard and what I would assume as well, it would be the vast majority of, of mm -hmm. cases in Botswana must be the South African variant at this point. It's yes, definitely going to be the dominant. Yeah, Dr. Moyo did say there is nothing uh, published, or but Dr. Moyo did say we're looking at anything between 60 to 80 percent. So yeah. it is the dominant variant. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, I think I think it's probably even higher than that now. I would, I would expect it's probably getting closer to ninety, mm -hmm. or, or the, you know, almost all of it. So uh, that's just the nature of of the beast. Yes. Yeah, and I think just to add on, thanks, David, to that. Uh, I see Dr. Malone's uh, comment. I think the the most important thing um, being in Botswana and our culture, you know, we need to involve uh, politicians, the Kosi religious leaders. I think these, especially outside uh, the cities, I think this would be very important to, to, to get people on board and to get them uh, vaccinated. And uh, I believe and would hope that the Ministry of Health campaign is actually going to be centered around that. Uh, uh, Dr. Ray, I think your hand is up. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think what um, what's really important, though, is to have, uh, whether it's the task force or some other body that responds to some of the misinformation on social media, because just as an example, there's a government site which lists a whole range of adverse reactions to um, to, to the vaccine. And people have been circulating that, you know, it's, it, it's thousands of adverse events. They circulate it and they only look at the headline and this has been scaring people and people don't read the actual text which says that this is based on a yellow card adverse event reporting system, which anyone can report. So if some, a member of the public has the vaccine and then has um, some other illness, they can report it in as an adverse event against the vaccine. And so if, if, these, um, if this misinformation isn't addressed quickly and systematically, these are the kinds of things that, that reinforce vaccine hesitancy. So there needs to be some way of doing that systematically to keep putting out um, bulletins to address the specific concerns that people have. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Ray. Um, I believe and hope that um, very soon some sort of uh, memo or address or an advertisement will come up to reassure our, our, the public. 
um, at seven past seven. Um, let me wrap up and thank um, every single participant uh, uh, for coming on and joining on, 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 on the webinar. I think uh, I'll, I'll just encourage people to clinicians, whether you're a lab scientist, doctor, nurse, um, uh, counselors, researcher, um, if you're involved in health in, in any way and you understand or have an understanding about vaccine, I think it's important that we really uh, stand behind our country and uh, to get people to, to really be positive about uh, vaccination. You know, one person can spread positivity to 10, 10 to 100. So I think, you know, getting people educated about this is, um, uh, is really important. Um, we will announce what our next uh, webinar topic uh, is. It would, um, uh, at, at the moment, we, 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 we are not, we just have to uh, be sure who our next speaker next week will, will be. Uh, on that note, thank you again, everyone, and uh, have a lovely evening this Thursday. Thank you, everyone.